Good evening and welcome to Ikaya Live, world news from the spiritual perspective and your premier news program for practical spiritual advice in your everyday life. My name is Andy and I work as operations manager here at Ikaya Center in Oslo, Norway. We are very pleased to have you with us both online on YouTube Live and our live studio audience here. Ikaya Live is a news program like no other in that we take the news topics of the day and rather than just presenting them, we dig into them, we pull them apart and look at the spiritual principles at play. Why do we do that? Because we're seeking to assist each other, ourselves, everyone in lifting their consciousness and really seeing the world around them from a higher perspective, getting a bigger picture. Spiritual teacher Ikaya presents the world's news from a perspective that really no one else does or can, and it makes it very interesting and exciting and also completely eye-opening to look at the world very differently. So together tonight, we're diving into a, quite a concerning topic for Billi literally billions of people across the world who are still in the remaining democracies. Because as we, as you may know, as most of us know from the news, democracy is under threat and has been for decades. Largely because those of us who live and grow up in democracies take them for granted and we don't do what's necessary to maintain and nourish them. So we're gonna dig in tonight to why increasingly across the Western world and all the democracies, we are actually choosing and electing more authoritarian, totalitarian, and dominant police state types of regimes in our own democracies and basically letting democracy decline. Why are we doing this? It's, it's just a fascinating topic and Akai has a perspective that will really open your mind and your heart. So let's dig in. And remember that Ikaya Live is a conversation, so it depends on your questions and also tonight, your comments, your perspective. And be sure to share tonight's episode right now before we get going because anyone, as fellow spiritual seekers, friends, family can join us live tonight or follow up later on to watch the episode again. So down below, like and share tonight's episode and subscribe to us here on YouTube and on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Ikaya.official. All right, we're ready to dive in by asking the very important question, why are we electing dictators? Ikaya? First, I think it's important to remind everyone that this is a spiritual discussion, not a political one. So it's important that we raise our consciousness and look at this and have fun with it because I don't take any of it seriously. Uh, neither should you. Uh, this is just, you know, what we do as humans to try to, f to figure things out. But the starting point is that democracy is an experiment, right? It's, a, it's an experiment that is very new. And it's based on the assumption that we're equal and that we want the same things, and that we're generous and all that, and we're not. Um, democracy works when we feel that we have our needs met when we kind of share values and we become more generous. But by nature, we're brutal. Humans are brutal. And we're competitive and we are hierarchical. When you look at human history, dictatorship is the only form of government humans have had, right? It's the continuation of the tribal way of thinking in the tribal way of organizing things. You have a person on top or people on top and then you have a hierarchy. That's what we're used to. That's in our genetics. We do not understand democracy, right? So it takes more of an abstract mind, more of an intellect to relate to democracy. So it's easier for humans to want democracy when they're fighting for their freedoms. But once they have them, they become hierarchical again. So we always gravitate towards dictatorships. We always want authoritarian regimes, right? So it's important to understand that democracy is not in our nature. And this is why when we become stressed, I've talked about this several times, but 
When we experience fear and stress and confusion, we will become much more genetic in our behavior, right? We're still apes uh, and we have not really changed a lot genetically over the last few hundred thousand years. There's very slight differences. So it means that we're still kind of the same, right? So on top of that, we have culture. So that is how we choose behavior collectively and how we train each other into a set of behaviors that we find work better, right? And it's not yet part of our genetic makeup, but over time it will be. So we both have your genetic programmings and then you have culture. But culture is volatile and it can change. So when we are in doubt about our own culture and the trained behaviors, we'll start relating to the genetic programmings. We all do this. So this is why we become what we often refer to as more binary when we're stressed and afraid. We see things in black and white because it is life and death, friend or enemy, all of that. So in this civilization, this culture, everything has become too complex, too difficult for us humans to handle. And it's too much at the same time and we're not used to that. And we have not successfully created a functioning culture, right? We can have ideals, we can have ideologies saying, oh, this is also wonderful, everything is working, and it's not. People's experience is that it's more confusing, people are more depressed, less happy, and feel they're kind of trapped in a society that does not belong to them anymore. And that's across the board. It doesn't mean what type of <clears throat> politics you subscribe to. People feel this way. And then the solution is, just like when we are afraid, we go back to our genetic programming. So that will start to influence our way of thinking and our behaviors much more. And then we see things more in black and white. So we become more extreme. right? As you can also see, when it comes to political extremism and any form of extremism. It could be religious, it could be diets, it can be whatever it is. It comes from stress. It comes from becoming more binary. Because then we can believe even harder that I've got the right solution because there's only two options and you're the good one. You're not the evil one, so you're the good one. Right, so we lose the ability to see things in a nuanced way. Democracy is very tricky because it is about including everyone, right? And making everyone feel seen and included. And it means it's necessary to be able to think several thoughts at the same time, be able to see things from several perspectives. Right? So like, yeah, that's a valid point. I understand you and he says, see where are you coming from? And on the other side, I can see where you are coming from. We need to find solutions that work for everyone, which means nobody will get exactly what they want, but we get something that can work for everyone. That is not part of our genetics, right? We're tribal. We're tribal hierarchical creatures. And as I've talked about many times, when it comes to evolution, we are supposed to believe in ourselves and fight to the death because over time it will show who was right. It will show who is better suited for survival. So we're just supposed to make up our mind about something and then test it out because nature doesn't know. We, doesn't, we don't know as individuals what will truly work. But over time, evolution will show us, right? So part of how we operate as a life form is that we're supposed to be stubborn. We're supposed to then just believe in ourselves. This thing where we listen to other people and all of that, that's culture, right? And it means that to be in that state, we need to be relaxed. We can't be too afraid and too stressed because then we will only interpret things in a black and white way. 
So again, democracy is an experiment and most likely it will not survive. Quite frankly, it's too advanced for humans, right? Because it only works when we are in a more relaxed, kind of de-stressed state and when we don't feel that we have to fight. The tribal way of thinking is the story about them, the others versus us, right? Look at all religions, all belief system. It's like, we are the chosen ones and the heretics, we should kill them. Like this is part of every kind of tribe. Their belief system would be about them. Their gods would be supportive of them and they would be helping them and fighting the enemy. So, Part of evolution means that, you know, when we develop our own ways and they work for us, we think it's universal. We aren't actually that stupid. So when you figure out how things work for you, you say, well, the whole world should be doing this because it's working for me. And politics is actually about that. It's people who think this is working for me, so everybody should do it. And then we fight it out. But the story about them is different from democracy because democracy is about the story about us, right? There's one big us where everyone's included. And the natural thing for human is us versus them. And the tricky thing is when it comes to our genetics is that we build identity not on who we are but on who we are not. This is why as we try to find out who we are, we criticize everyone. No, I don't like that person. Look at that, that's terrible. They are wrong, they are wrong, they are wrong. They should be killed, you know, they should be enslaved. And through a process of elimination, we get to better understand who we are. Just like children, right? In the beginning, when children don't know what they like, they relate to what they don't like, so they can say no. They have no idea what they actually like, but they can recognize what they don't like. Right? So every yes starts with a no. Every identity begins with the elimination of what you recognize does not resonate with you. So this is where the story of the others. It's that big them that represents everything that does not resonate with you. And of course, they should be eliminated because once you figure out what works for you, that's good. That's how it's supposed to be and the rest should be eliminated. So, if you're in a tribe, you will go to war, you, know, you will kill, you will do whatever is necessary to be dominant. Because the dominant individual or tribe will win. This is how evolution works. It's not about being right. This is also, you know, in our especially Western world, when it comes to how we uh, think and how we relate to things in, uh, intellectually, we believe that kind of right and wrong, what is good, you know, that is stronger and that will survive. But dominance is right. That's been the way throughout evolution. So, you don't have to be right to dominate. Dominance makes you right. So, if you want to be right, you will seek dominance. And when we think of where we're at now, where people feel disenfranchised, they feel confused, they are afraid, all of that. It is like, enough, I, I, I need to be right. Genetically, for your survival, in the game of evolution and procreation, you have to be right. So, you need to dominate. This is why, for instance, when men have a conversation and they disagree, they will be louder, you know, and then the threats begins. If that doesn't help, violence. It's about dominating. 
right? It's about asserting dominance. It's not about who's right because then you can just Google it, right? It's about dominance because dominance makes right. So when you feel all of this and the world is so difficult, the way to win is through domination. And think of people who are disenfranchised, like, you know, the, the people who feel they've not gotten the life they deserve, right? What we do then, as always, is to, to create the story about them. We've always done this. It's always them, right? Those people, those are the ones who stop me from having the life I deserve. They, they are the ones. They steal. They do this. They do that. Throughout human history, it's been the default. And in your own life, you're doing the same, right? Just think of all the excuses we're making up about other people and how they are in your way. It starts with how we are blaming our parents, right, for a lack of success and lack of happiness. And then it goes on. It could be our partners or bosses, like everything. It's always them. So it's a natural way of thinking. And in recent history, you saw that, for instance, with the Jews. For some reason, they're still very popular when it comes to that model. Uh, but we create, you know, the thems, the people on the other side, and we blame them for everything. So, if you have a functional life, if you're happy, if you're middle class, okay, the story about them will not be as strong. But if you're losing, and what we're seeing, for instance, in the States is that the middle class, they're kind of starting to slip backwards, which means they are now losing. And then the genetic story about them, you have to find the them. And if you're already at the bottom and you feel this is very unfair, you need someone to blame. So the story about them becomes very strong. And you can't win. Right? In life today, many people feel that they've lost. Right? And they can't win. Many young people, they will never be able to afford their own home, right? Many people feel they've lost and there's no way out. So they can't play the game. So how do you win? You dominate, right? Then this is where authoritarian individuals come in because this is the story they always use. They use the them. It's always someone to blame. It's always, you know, that. So they're then igniting the hate. And they are justifying their story about them. And, you know, the smart authoritarians, they will have multiple thems. So you can point in many directions and find people to blame who are stopping, who represent the problem. Because it's never you, of course. You're just the victim, right? And this is also the thing, authoritarian individuals, they always portray themselves as victims, right? Because things are happening to them, you know? So they're suffering uh, for the sake of the people, right? So people can recognize because they are like, pe people on the bottom are also the victim story. You only need the story about them if you feel victimized, if you believe in that. So authoritarian figures, it's, it's just a good match, right? And narcissists always feel like they're victimized and they should be you know, something great. So, so uh, narcissists always live through the stories of, of them if they don't get what they want. So it's quite natural, right? You can only win if you dominate. In democracy, you need skills. You need intellect, you need education, right? And that works, but not for everyone. And we've now created a civilization that is very difficult for people to, to deal with. And people are very depressed, we're stressed, we're very unhealthy, right? And people are experiencing this. And of course, it's not their fault, it's always them. So. Then we create all these conspiracy theories 
because you know we need to justify the them so it's it's no end to the evil they represent you know if they're sacrificing babies and drinking their blood or whatever it is it's that you know because we really need to go to the root of the evil here and that will also dehumanizing the them also justify killing them right so we need to make up all of these stories so you can dominate because if you are a normal person and they are just normal people how can you justify your dominance so we need to dehumanize and create stories and now people are doing this all over and most people today in in our world in our society they have multiple stories of them it just you know it's just based on your perspective of where you're standing right because you always represent what's good so it means you know and we are so easily fooled because remember that this is how we operate this is how your subconscious work you know how a hierarchy works you know how power and dominance works it's part of your genetics it's part of this life form so your submission to a strong leader feels right then there's order and we in the west completely overestimate you know how people want freedom people talk about freedom but people want freedom from the others they want a f- they want freedom from them so when you agree with the message of an authoritarian figure your experience is that finally normalcy will happen because this is a, just the description of my reality right and for everyone else of course it's not we had a question yes i've been uh, trying to observe when to ask this because a key in rural norway here he and i are thinking about democracy and you're starting in well first you've been talking about the other and now we're moving into hierarchy and it seems like one of the strengths of democracy has been that it plays on human nature and hierarchy because we're kind of choosing our leaders and you know somebody has to rise to the top but one of the frustrations i think in especially recent modern democracy is that so often the candidates we are choosing between are selected in a in a way behind closed curtain you know like there and it often is just awful candidates that we're choosing between <laughs> so in a sense there's like uh, it seems like this strange mix of uh, some level of like dictatorial power structure behind the the democracy and is there anything to that and part is that part of why democracy is in decline today again we need to understand that human nature is hierarchical and dictatorial so on all levels you will find that for a democracy to function the hierarchy needs to be based on merit on skills and that is really the essence of democracy is that everyone can climb the ladder and contribute to society and do something with themselves based on their skills and who they are and you know that should be how they climb instead of being born into position or that uh you belong to a certain elite and that doesn't work for everyone also because corporations do they have too much power there is a ruling class of course and the people in it they're just you know playing the game because they can we are hierarchical so once you reach a certain level you want to stay there and how do we stay we make sure that others do not compete with us it's in human nature so it's impossible for democracy not to become hierarchical not to become a dictatorship because 
um, when you have something that is in human nature, okay, let's think of when you have a system based on merit and diversity, it's more difficult for you to understand who's who. In a tribe, we're all on the same page. We feel the same, we have the same values, right? And we know who the others are because they have the wrong values and they do the wrong thing, right? And then we feel safe. We feel comfortable when we are with people we understand. This is why, friends, when people belong to a certain church or whatever it is, they feel we, we share values, I can trust you. Remember, like for a tribe, trusting each other has been absolutely fundamental. And how we trust each other is by daily affirmation of trust, daily affirmation of value. Basically, we do things together. We communicate in ways that constantly and consistently are showing our values, that we are on the same page, that we can trust each other, right? And that builds that type of trust. Now, in a democracy, one will have more diversity, more, and you will have more ways of thinking, right? You will have more smaller groups, different identities, this, that, and they can all arise. They can all uh, climb based on their merits. It's very, very confusing. So, the more we have of that, we come to a point where then the people will start to slide back and they will feel, this is not work. I, I don't understand the rules. This is not my world. And they all went to win. I need to dominate. And then the fighting begins. And we will seek, we will seek leaders that we can identify with, but we want them to beat the competition. It's not about finding good solutions for everyone anymore. I'm a victim. You need to fight for me. So we become more narrow-minded. We become more interested in specific things that are important to us. It's not about making society work. It's about like, this is important to me. You need to fight for me. So you will then elect leaders and politicians and whatever that have more of those characteristics that are more story-based, that operate on emotions, and also know how to trigger that in you. In our part of the world, the smart people have left government, right? Because intelligent people, they're able to see things from many perspectives. And they will say, well, you know, you're, you can say to an opponent, you're completely right about this. I see your point. And people don't want that today, right? Because all intelligent people, when you get to a certain level, you're starting to see things from many different perspectives. That's part of being an intelligent person, that you're educated. It means that you belong to many spaces, you're able to see where people are coming from, you understand. You're able to place yourself in other people's shoes and you get them, you understand them, and then you will try to make the best out of everything. You're not competitive. You say, I come from this reality, but I also understand the difference between right and wrong ethically, right? Because that's universal. So we'll try to create solutions for everyone. So people don't want that anymore. So politicians with that ability, they will lose office. They will not be reelected. So we're in this phase of, of our history where people want someone to represent their anger, that they want to win, they want to dominate. So you get these one-trick ponies that has no education, but what they have is anger. They're able to insist, and they just try to dominate. They don't know anything about anything, but that's why they are elected. People don't want knowledgeable people anymore. They just want the feeling. They want someone to fight for them, right? And it's just a sign that we're in a state of systemic stress, that we are co in collective fear, and we've lost as individuals the ability to navigate, right? So we're just frustrated and we're just like, you know, and we don't understand what people to choose because we see they're all corrupt. 
And the reason that we believe that is because when we, in a democracy, we don't have to fight for a, at anything. Look at what's happened to our psyche. We become consumers. And a consumer want what he wants when he wants it. And if not, he turns into a Karen. So we're used to being served. So when politicians don't give us what we want based on our special whatever it is, we complain. So we're also in a very kind of narrow-minded perspective as individuals. We don't understand that things take time. We have lost patience. And we believe in our right as consumers. I feel this, you know, this is my need. And you don't care about anyone one else. So it's a collective um, kind of way of thinking and a collective consciousness in our part of the world. As a light, we become more and more tribal. And that always ends up in dictatorships. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have a question in the audience. Yes, um, I'm not sure if this is a question, but it's more like a reflection um, to what you're talking about. Um, being studying with you for many, many years, I experienced that a lot of your studies about kind of going beyond kind of the human cultural uh, structures and how kind of you function here. And for me, at least, I experienced that I've been studying a lot of those kind of structures going both into dominance going to the opposite side of being the victim, going into the kind of um, uh, kind of state where you almost get uh, withdrawn and is invisible. And for me, it has been interesting to see also kind of when you take yourself out in a way from those structure, you almost get invisible. It's almost like you don't, people don't recognize you anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've been mean, experienced like both being very dominant and be very like recognized, but also being very withdrawn and almost being invisible. Um, so yeah, so at least what I'm, I'm exploring is uh, like how can you can then be present and um, connect to to uh, being here and and mm -hmm. without going into dominance or victim or like you have to kind of in a way um, uh, deal with a hierarchical hierarchical mm -hmm. uh, system but without necessarily be identified with it or yeah so sure mm. yes it is like you know being an artist when everyone else is a football player. Right, and it's just that. Um, the, th the thing is, where we are right now is that because we're consumers, I'll get back to this, I'll just make a little loop here. We want something. And the them, the stories about them is that they have taken it from us, right? They are the reason why I don't get what I deserve and what's my right. So, a democracy only works when we all focus on what can I contribute, right? This is why it's a system based on merit, your skills, who you are, what you can be become, and that you want to be the best version of yourself. So you want to contribute to the world around you. It's not what you can get, right? It's what you can create. It's what you can build. It's, it's how you can be something beyond yourself and see, I have something, I have skills, I have talents, how can I apply that to the world around me, right? A democracy can only work when that's the case. We're in a space now where people are only thinking, what can I get out of it? Most people. And the interesting thing is the people who want to contribute, who want to make something of themselves, they've never had more opportunities to do so. This is also why when you look at innovation, right? How companies can go from zero to like, you know, a billion dollar company in a few years. That was not a thing when you go back a few generations. It's not like we all have to become billionaires, but there are so many different levels and types of success if we want to contribute to the world. 
we have never had more opportunities. We can, you know, there are so many options. We can make something out of ourselves, no matter what we are, who we are. But we need to stop feeling entitled and victimized for not having those entitlements met. Because then we just want to dominate. That's when the screaming and yelling begins. So this has been kind of the turning point, right? And in our own, like, personal process, it's much of the same kind of movement. If we look at the world and we think, like, I'm entitled, I need this, people should see me, see, people should understand me, um, you will suffer. If you understand that, you have skills. You have talents. You were born as a living workshop, right? Your job is to figure out, like, what are you? What are your skills? What are your intelligences? How can you apply it? How can you then use the world to grow yourself and also make the world around you grow? And we can all find our own path. And this is in a way, the sad part to where we are historically, because humans have never had more opportunities to do so. And less and less people are doing it. And in the future, the creative class will be the ruling class. It will be a few generations, but people who are not using their skills, they will be on the bottom. It's still like that today. But we are letting the people who are not contributing because there is more of them. They are the ones now deciding who's to lead government. So we have the ones who are more entitled, who are not contributing, who are not able to use their skills. They want to dominate. And so Democracy will end up there always because there, there, there will always be more on the bottom. And when they don't believe in the story that you know, we're all the same and we can do something with ourselves, they will resort to this because that's the genetic programming. So when we're not kind of part of this game, in many ways we do become invisible because these are the rules of our society, of our civilization. And sometimes it's also spiritual, we have different goals, right? It's not, we, we don't want to dominate. And we don't have to. We can find our own way. We can have success. But it comes down to how we unpack our own consciousness, our own skills and intelligence, the how we figure out new ways to use it, because this is also how we lift the planet. Today we need to find new pathways. Right? And that is an important part of what we do as, as spiritual beings. And when we are in the process of, of waking up, trying to see past what is going on in the world? And I said, the collective consciousness is where it is. It's not a problem. It's just a reality. And we can operate from a place of healing and from a place of love. And it means that we're not necessarily out there to dominate or to prove that we are right. right? We can make ourselves blossom. We can unfold who and what we are because we have the freedom to do so. Again, there's never been more opportunities for everyone to be and become who they want to be and achieve what they want. And there's never been more spiritual freedom on this planet than right now. Right? So this is also the thing. As a person of a spirit, are you actually utilizing that? If we go back a few hundred years, right, the religion or the beliefs would be mandatory. Right? And if you did not, if you were not part of it, you would be killed. So we live in a space, in a time, where we have the freedom to explore spirituality in our own way. And it's the same thing. Right? How much um, 
effort are actually putting in. Because that window may close again. As we are moving <coughs> towards a, a stricter society with more control and less freedom. Remember that people don't want freedom. That's an illusion. They want comfort, they want safety. And that means that someone else is taking, like, is making all the decisions. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we do have a question from Celine on YouTube that goes to the heart of tonight's episode and really is a principal question of the physics of democracy. Does or do our voice and our vote actually matter in democracy? It's a good question. And I would say yes. Remember that ultimately, this is just consciousness and expression. It is so easy when we get triggered as a person that we start to believe that any of this is real. What we are experiencing in this horizontal world are just renderings of consciousness and karma, right? And it's the evolutionary processes we need to go through, but in and of itself, it's not real. So what you do in your world, in your existence, ultimately is about the enfoldment of you. We should never look at the world around us and say, well, because they are doing that, then I should know. Then you're living from the story of them and how you get victimized by it. And then you make your decisions and behave based on that story. What we need to learn is to be completely unconditional in our behavior and the way we think and feel. You need to understand what your values are. What do you want to represent in the world? And how does that translate into behaviors and actions and manifestations? And then we need to be that person regardless of what other people do. Because other people do not decide. For instance, casting a vote could be part of you know, your value system and what you see as important as an expression of who you are and that you're taking part. It doesn't matter what other people do, even if your vote matters because it's you expressing yourself in a collective consciousness. And remember that matter is not real. Consciousness, intention, vibration, energy and information, that is real. So, when you cast a vote, it's a different energy. You're sending out a different information, right? And that becomes part of the collective. That's different from you saying, well, it doesn't matter anyway. What energy is that? What value is that? What are you then emanating? What are you contributing to the cosmic soup of this planet and this civilization? Everything we do, everything we vibrate, think and feel, it all matters. Because whatever we vibrate, the energy that we're in, it's all part of the collective, right? You are a co-creator of reality. It's not like you are here and that you've got nothing to do with it. You are part of the creation. And you do that in your own way. But it doesn't matter what other people are doing and their intentions. What matters are only your intentions. And if you're living from the heart, if you're living from what you perceive to be the highest truth, right? Because that matters. And when you bring in your highest intention, that will vibrate. That will be part of the evolution of the collective. So again, 
Never use what is happening around you as an excuse or a way to shut down or a way to not live up to your highest expectations, your highest potential. It's exactly when we meet this type of um, You could say negativity or uh, low consciousness in the world. Exactly then, we need to lift our own consciousness and behave from a higher intention. That is how it can be healed. If you instead become a mirror of that energy, you are reinforcing it. And this is we do this so often, right? We let ourselves be triggered. And as I often say, when we let ourselves be triggered, we become part of the very energy and expression that we are reacting to. And you react to something because this is not in harmony, this, this is not right, and then you become an extension of it. And it's not smart. During these times, we need to decide what we want to represent in the world, and we have to do this regardless. It's a very important spiritual practice. You should not become the extension of the imbalances you see. You need to represent the healing. You need to represent the solution. And you will never do that by fighting, but by becoming a tuning fork of kind of pure intention and high consciousness. Yes, you're, you are addressing Celine's further question already, but more specifically, how, what types of actions would characterize um, basically yeah, that higher intention and consciousness in uh, support of democracy beyond just signing the paper of the, the vote ballot? Now, democracy is not necessarily better because it's too advanced for humans at this point. The only thing that is important is that everyone incarnating have their opportunity to work out their karma and to study themselves and unfold their consciousness. And authoritarian regimes are more in line with where people are at this point. And that we need to let that happen. There's an, we don't have to fight it. We cannot, you know, decide what human nature is. We have to work with human nature and accept it. And then see how can we bring about growth from this point? How can we bring about healing? So, number one, spiritual. We need to free ourselves from the assumption that something in this world is very important and we need to fight for it. This is the echo of everybody's consciousness. What comes into being is inevitable because it represents kind of the summary of everything present. And when the souls incarnating into humans, when this is their karma, and when they're still working with an ego that's deeply hierarchical, where they're not taking responsibility for themselves, this is what we get. So we need to meet everything with love, no matter what it is. An acceptance, not thinking that this solution is better. It doesn't matter. It's just role play. It's just souls experimenting with different positions and belief systems and expressions and this and that to figure things out. And just like with identity, often we figure out what works by trying things that don't work. It's a process of elimination. And we need to allow for others to do that. Often when we have certain insights, when we reach certain realizations spiritually, it's because the universe has given us space to make many mistakes, to harm ourselves and others, to live out our you know, primitive positions, until we figure out, well, this is not working. And then we learn. 
it's an important part of how we grow spiritually. It's not like we just sit in meditation and then we understand, we have insights and then we get it. And we have not ever done anything that doesn't work, right? We all do it. So today, we need to have an enormous amount of empathy and acceptance for the fact that for this planet to move forward, we need to work out all of these kind of old cultural ways, all of these very primitive ways of living and being together. We need to be able to handle diversity. We need to be able to handle that through many different kind of pathways in the same space. And it's difficult for humans. It's not natural. We have to create culture. It will take time and there will be a lot of screaming, a lot of conflict. And as I've said many times, this is what's going on on the planet. Our job is to nurture and understand just like, you know, if you want to learn how to ride a bike, you have to allow your children, you know, to fall off the bike and not necessarily injure themselves, but, you know, they will get scratches and they will bleed this, you know, it's part of it. We need to allow for everyone to go through what is necessary for their learning. Fighting spiritual growth is not something you do when you wake up. You will see that, all right, you, know, you can see where people are coming from, you can see their karma, you can see why they have to go through what they're going through and they will incarnate it with people who are experiencing the same thing but from a different angle so they can just fight it out and figure it out. It's necessary and it's beautiful. So learn to not fight anything on this planet. Learn to show what happens after. Because if you have reached a point where you're not part of those fights anymore, it's because you've already been there and done that. And now you need to allow for others to go through the same thing. You should be the wise one. You should be able to look at it with an enormous love and with the, with the anticipation of what happens after. So you need to demonstrate what comes next. What comes after this, when we are in this primitive state as humans and when we have figured out who do we become, how do we behave? We can set the example, but then you have to live up to your own values and your own realizations if you have them for real. We can't be part of it. We need to show the higher level, again, what comes after because this planet will move through um, a phase of you know about 200 years where there will be a lot of changes that are absolutely necessary and it's wonderful but it will be so messy right because humans have to move out of their primitive states and figure out how to heal themselves and then the planet. Your job is to show the way. And you don't do that by having biases, by thinking that one way is better, by operating from fear, thinking that, oh, we have to do this or else. There is room for everything. So we should, in everything we do, Try to show love, try to show empathy, try to hold space so that others can go through whatever it is they need to go through in order to grow. And we can just like vibrate what comes after when we have healed. So on the in Finland, she brings us to exactly this point of like which direction to go. Uh, what represents more healing because in Finland they're having presidential elections soon and on the one hand she sees she would really like to vote with a good and gentle candidate uh, who has intentions about protecting the environment and lifting the people but then another part of her looks at the times we live in and that Russia's on their doorstep, war is close, it's unstable times, crises are increasing so 
kind of <laughs> how do we tune in to exactly what you say, the next step? You will not find the solution in politics, that's for sure, right? So in, in that way, you, you will never find a candidate that represents higher consciousness because politics is just part of this game. It's part of the kindergarten and, you know, for the kids to work it out. It's more about your intention. Are we acting from fear? Right? Are we acting from a conviction that I know what's best? Or are we listening? Are we in a state of healing? Politicians will never heal the world. The solutions are never in politics today. It's everywhere else. So it's more like, again, what do you carry? What do you vibrate? And how do you demonstrate that? It's also a reality that um, there is a war going on and that can also discipline us a little bit because in the West we become, again, too entitled and we just believe that we can have anything we, we want and that our small problems become so big because we feel they're so big and uh, war kind of disciplines us a little bit and that is healthy. Uh, we also need to understand how the world works. And it's brutal because humans are basically animals with culture. Um, so do not be naive about what's going on in the world today. We can't just, you know, we, or we can't even want to, but, but many of us are living in a fantasy Right? And realities of how this planet operates as a civilization, it's, it's pretty primitive. Right? So the solution is not in politics. Um, so whatever we vote for, I think it's just like what values do we want to represent? How do we see how we can navigate? Because we're also part of this world. Right? But don't take it too seriously. It's just karma being worked out by individuals in different positions. It's all role play. At the end, it is about expansion and healing. And this culture, well, after a couple of hundred years, they will get to a place where one will have kind of solved this because it is so out of date at this point. Uh, humans need to become more advanced and uh, rather quickly. So there is a phase now where everything is more intense. The karmic processes on this planet has been heated up a little bit. Uh, and everyone's confronted and everyone attacks the others. And, you know, of course, you are part of the others to other people. And they are the others to you. And th this, this is, you know, until we figure it out. But it will take time. And a lot of people will die. But, you know, that's, that's part of it. Um, we exist forever. And when we go into a lifetime, we have a full understanding of what's going on and when we're going to leave. So we know exactly spiritually what the journey is and what the potentials are. So there's no need to fear anything. Just participate. Right? The worst thing we can do is to withdraw and not be part of it, right? So try whatever you do to be a tuning fork for higher consciousness, but without judgment, without bias, right? And just at the same time, try to participate in creating the life that you think is right. You're also, your body is part of evolution, which means, again, as a person, you should also, in a way, think of what you think is the best way to live. What values do you represent? And vote from there. There are no easy solutions. There are no, like, right or wrong way to do anything. Th this is like, we all want that black and white. But life is extremely complex. 
And this is also, you know, the more we do self-growth work, the more we meditate, the more we connect spiritually, we become the opposite of binary, right? So, as I said, the level of stress and fear determines how extreme we become, how polarized we become, how many conspiracy theories we believe in, because that comes from stress and fear. So, the more connected we are to ourselves, the more pragmatic we become, because we're like, oh, my position, oh, that's just me. I can freely just move into other people's position. I can understand them fully. We're not as invested in any particular position. We can see everything, right? We become more generous and inclusive. And this is always the solution. We need to do the work. We need to meditate. We need to cleanse. We need to purify until we experience ourselves in our hearts and our minds to not be aggressive, to not be biased, to not believe that I'm right and they're wrong. Because as long as we're being triggered and we think that there's something wrong happening, we're in a very low consciousness, we're not connected. Then we are in a state of stress and fear. And as we know, spiritual practices, if done correctly, will decrease your stress and fear, and over time you will have none of it. And then you expand, right? You go from black and white, you get more and more colors, more and more shades, and everything opens up, and then you can see the beauty in the world. Even in war, you see the beauty, you see the growth, and you see the healing, and you see why it's necessary. You act from a very different perspective. So. The most important thing we can all do is stick to your spiritual practices. If you don't have one, please establish one. Meditate enough to open your heart to be in a pure state so you may be a vehicle for love and healing. It doesn't mean that the world would not go through what is necessary, but it means that you can still vibrate the solution. The solution is always higher consciousness. The solution is always love. So we can both be part of a horizontal but at the same time not have identity connected to it. We have a question in the audience. Yeah, um, I was thinking uh, just a perspective of the outdated belief systems that we are choosing i mean they're little the, the, like the presidents they're literally should have been retired a long time ago i mean they're they're soon dead they're so old and yeah <laughs> so it's 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 of course a mirror to that outdated belief but also i'm thinking is it too early for us the people who feel like on the side of this who don't agree with any of the political systems is it too early for those people to start creating new political systems and financial structures because of where the point of the consciousness of the humans are? A uh, short answer, yes. Because remember that over the next 200 years, the accelerated uh, evolution of humans will be massive. So it will be a massive detox, basically that everything will have to surface, so humans will have more than enough just trying to not be consumed by their own filth <laughs> and to choose to detoxify instead, right? That needs to happen before there is a foundation in the collective consciousness for something more advanced. Because again, humans cannot even deal with democracy. They don't want it because it means that we have to be equal. We have to see each other. And we can do that for as long as we agree, as long as we're like-minded. So what we're seeing you know, in democracy is that we still clump together. We find our tribes. So in democracy, we end up being tribes again. And we still fight to the death because, you know. Mm -hmm. And also, look at spiritual communities, right? can do the same thing. We can create our own bubble and then be better than all others because we know what's right. 
the same thing. It's genetic. It's not spiritual. Right? The spiritual position is including everything, loving everything. Not be selective, because life loves everything and everyone equally, regardless. Because whatever anyone is doing, it's just part of how they learn. Right? And that is the spiritual position. So it's also kind of learning that and also seeing through the tribalism in our culture right now and see that in a lot of like spiritual work, the same thing is happening. And then we're retrieving into fantasy, just like people are doing with all the belief systems and things they are creating politically. It's the same thing. So we're not necessarily better, but we should be. At least we should be more aware of our patterns <coughs> and then try to heal them. We should be the ones in front showing how it's done. So growing out of our biases and how we want to judge and how we want to change the world, there's a link. So the world does not need changing. It needs evolution, two different things. Right? So we need to relax all that. It's far too early for solutions. Um, innovation will also happen, but when it comes to these big systemic changes, humans are not ready yet. Not at all. Um, but it will come. Uh, not in your lifetime, though. So, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> what, one, one, yeah? We have a question from Ninetta on YouTube. Okay. You talk about the new paradigm as another perspective and that mm -hmm. people in the new paradigm will be separated from the old. Are there no, quote unquote, others from that perspective? And how is that reality going to be different from today's? <laughs> Like basically what we refer to as the new paradigm is, is simply that when humans have worked out this <coughs> a more primitive karma and start to realize that, oh, all right, we're actually part of the ecosystem. We're not in control of it. Uh, we're part of something greater than ourselves. And developing a like healthier mindset, a more balanced mindset, it comes through self-destruction. It comes through realizing that this is not working. So this is where we are. Uh, so the new paradigm is, is basically just once we're kind of past this phase of uh, human civilization, human evolution, humans will become smarter. And it's also, as I talked about, because more advanced souls or atmas are incarnating. So that will also change uh, human behavior quite a lot. And it's just a natural process that the ones who incarnate now, they need this journey. If you incarnate later in this life form, because then you need that. There is nothing wrong or right with any of it. It's just diff different levels, right? So many who incarnate now will have a lot of conflict as part of their karma uh, and a lot of identity and being invested in something they need to grow out of, like that movement. Remember that the collective journey is also the individual one, right? Because the collective is also all individuals present. So those who need that journey are incarnating. And uh, at the later point, um, others will incarnate, may be more adjusted to that reality. So it's a completely natural thing happening. It's just that it's happening in a very short kind of time frame compared to how evolution normally happens. Also because it is not just humans left to their own devices. It is act actively being kind of turned up. Because if this kind of slow process happens, humans will destroy themselves and they will destroy the planet. Uh, so by, by making it kind of faster, it means that humans will go into so much conflict that they don't have time to ruin the planet. So uh, <laughs> well, basically, they will have to deal with their own process and their own karma and work it out, at least get to a level where they start understanding that humans are part of life, not an exception. So humans will get there. But, and this is how humans get there. We, again, we're just in the very beginning of it. 
and back to the studio audience. Ikaya, so we had um, um, peasants' revolt in beginning of January, 8th of January, which was like 500 years later, or 500 years um, ago, we had another one. So I would very much um, like to hear your perspective, especially in Germany, um, so many countries that uh, are close to Germany came actually to Germany to support that. Mm -hmm. And not only the peasants, but also like small businesses came to support that kind of movement. Would you comment on that, please? It's the same thing. It's basically that we create a civilization that is so complex that politicians have no idea what they're doing. Uh, and business, large corporations really don't know what they're doing and they don't care because they just want to make money. Um, so it means that it's difficult for people to, to navigate back to the feeling that people have lost uh, influence over their own lives. Um, democracy has created the illusion that people have something, you know, that they have a voice. When you look at human history, humans have never had a voice. Power has always been power. And when you are, you know, in this kind of seat of power, you will only care about your own needs. You will just use everything as your personal <coughs> property. And people love that shit. So, because, you know, people are drawn to those types of leaders. And, and so, um, they don't want leaders who are not corrupt. Corruption is the sign that, you know, they're living the dream. And uh, humans are drawn to corruption. So, but then at the same time, like situations like that, where people can feel this is very unfair, I'm fighting for it. That's also part of how different perspectives are presenting themselves in the game of evolution. Again, we're supposed to represent different positions. And as I said, evolution is all this kind of random mutation, <coughs> new things are happening here and there, and then they just like figure out what will work better. And what will work better is what is dominant. It's never about what's true or right, it's simply about what will dominate, because that is what survives. So what they're trying to do then is dominate. It's how you get the message through, right? It's not by information. So when people support, it's to create dominance. Right? Because we're still animals. So that's what's going on. And from the game of evolution, instead of voicing that, vibrating that, and creating a manifestation of dominance so that it becomes information in the collective consciousness. And then that can then kind of influence. Uh, but this will happen more and more. Because people feel that life does not represent them anymore. Society does not represent them. We are genetically hardwired to live in small tribes. And we're so not. And it confuses everyone. Because we want things our way. And in a complex democracy, we will never have that. And then we're solely the idea that we should. That's it. This is why we are consumers. This is why we become so obsessed and addicted to consumption because then we can have it our way. And in a democracy, we say, no, it's negotiation, it's compromise. And then it's corrupt anyway because humans are corrupt. Because the hierarchy is there, so people who seek money and power, they will get money and power because that's what they do. You can't change human nature, right? So no matter the systems, humans will always end up with corrupt ruling classes that suck all the juice out of any juice box they can find and oppress the people in the bottom. And people elect them to do so. Because it's in our nature. Like, one, one thing that's really funny about this is that again, when we're stressed and we become insecure, okay, we don't have to navigate on our own. What do we want? We cry for mommy 
or daddy. Because it's in our genetics, right? So, when we look at how our brain works, and this is both funny and scary at the same time, because a child is not able to recognize when it's doing something right or something is working because it has no idea. What he can understand, if his mommy and daddy is happy with him, is he does something, mommy smiles, I did it right. He has no idea what he did or why or why it's working, but he can sense, see that mommy is happy. I did good. So we learn this first because we don't understand how the world works. So until we do, we look to mommy and daddy for confirmation that we're doing the right thing. So when life then becomes very difficult to navigate and we have no idea what we're doing, we move back into that pattern. And then we want mommy or daddy. When it comes to politicians, often it's daddy. The authoritarian leader will most of the time portray himself as the big father, right? Look at dictators. They're always portrayed this way. It's the father who loves his children, right? And he's suffering for them, right? He only does what's right. And like, and everybody knows that if children are left to their own devices, they will do naughty things and they will harm themselves. So everything he does is really to protect themselves against themselves because he just wants what's right for everyone. Like in a family, the dad will have to balance different interests and know what's right. This is how every dictator sells himself. And it works. Because when life is difficult, when we feel that daddy is happy with me, I've done good. That will be more important to you than ethics, laws, anything. Because then you know. It's religious. So, when you feel that level of insecurity, you want to serve a dictator. You want to serve absolute authority. Because then you know you're doing the right thing. It's a feeling. And you can kill for that. Many people do. And they're convinced they're doing the right thing because it feels right. They have no idea. They don't care about ethics or laws. Human psychology is quite volatile when it comes to ethics. This is much more important. This is also why when things are unstable, people become fascist like that. We all have it in us. It's just what does it take? What type of situation? You could become that as well. Now, one thing that's very important also, when we look at Second World War, and we look at you know, the case of Hitler, the Nazi party, is basically understanding that you are the Nazis. And it's recognizing how we are hardwired. The Nazis were just normal people. And how easily manipulated we are based on our patterns and fear and confusion. And once we go there and we then have that affirmation from a group or a tribe, we are willing to do absolutely anything. It's not a special case, it's the norm. Right? Hitler was, you know, a failed artist with Parkinson's. The rest was normal people because they wanted so bad that dictator. Most people do. And it only takes a, like enough confusion and fear and feeling that they are the problem. So we need to look at this in ourselves too. But that again, that feeling that we get when then serving daddy, getting that confirmation. Again, we need to understand that that will be more important to the human brain than anything else. 
And this is why it's happening. We feel that when then we're on the right side. Just like the loyalty that a child can have to their parents can make that child do anything. And it feels right. Finally, there's order in the world. Right? And because this develops in a child, it's, it's the deepest part of their brain programming. Right? So the ones who have experienced this and where the parents, maybe the circumstance, have made the child feel that the world is dangerous and it works if I just do what my parents want, and that's become even more important, they are the ones even more likely to submit to this type of leadership, and they want it. You see it even in business, right? There can be bosses that are very authoritarian, and you will have certain employees that is like, kissing their asses all the time because they get so much out of just doing that, that feeling of being and doing right. And this is a big part of why people are electing these people. Because then you're proving your loyalty to daddy and it feels good. Now, I have my family, I have my tribe, I have my daddy, everything will be okay. We're all on the same page. That feeling is so important to people when they feel that the world is unstable. And this is why it's happening. This is why it's happening now. This is why people want, once they have a dictator, they cannot let go of them because it's addictive. That relationship is addictive. And both parties get something out of it. And when then people are punished, you know, when freedoms are taken away, it's just like in a family where daddy has to give one of the children a good spanking. That's how you rationalize it. This is how you deal with it emotionally. It's necessary. And that can actually trigger you to be even more, you know, loyal. So you will lie. You will kill, you will do anything, because then you're showing your loyalty. Then you can be daddy's favorite child. Emotionally, it's so powerful. And you've seen this also in communism, you know? Everybody lies, right? Everybody snitches, because they want to be daddy's favorite child, and it feels so good. So you have fear on that one side, but you have the emotional reward on the other side. It's a very addictive combination, right? And remember that this is part of our genetic makeup. It's in us. Democracy is not. So, you know. It's back to the studio audience. I guess this is a little continuous of what you just talked about. So we have this political systems outside of us, but on the inside it's just the same. I have the tyrant that whips me and the desperation of trying to become better. Exactly. And of course, then I understand that that's not good. So then I try to love myself and smear that on me. And then I can feel sorry for myself. And then I can give myself comfort because I'm sorry for, you know, the whole shebang that we have as human beings. Yes. And whatever position we have then is just as imbalanced and as any other position. So to navigate this and work with this, do you have any tips of how to deal with that? Well, I think what, what you're mentioning is so important because what we're seeing in the world is simply the externalization of our inner process. And the more noise we have, the more inner conflicts we have, the more that will externalize, right? This is, again, why inner work is so important because we have to heal inside. We have to heal our karma and our process and consciousness. It's the only way to heal the world. We cannot heal and balance the world for as long as people are imbalanced in themselves. Because the outer world is the echo. So it's back to doing the work. And understand that genetically, yes, we, we have all of this going on inside of us. And the reason is also, if we think of the kind of tribal model, we are supposed to be able to go into any type of position. Right? It's like we can be a dictator. We can be a slave. We can be anything in between. 
we can be a man or a woman depending on what's necessary. We all have it in us. So there's also a way we, we already have the spectrum of positions um, and we already have that role play. We are both the dictator, we are the slave, we are the liberator, uh, we are, you know, the, we are the farmer, we are the family, we, we have all these different roles. And we're all of it. And that's fun. We don't have to be confused. We should embrace different aspects. And so they all have their place because it enables us to identify different vibrations, different types of karma. And if we also recognize that, when one of these kind of characters in our mind speaks up, it's because it's in us. But it's easier for us to recognize when a tyrant is behaving like a tyrant than if that came through a kind of generic expression as just information. So it makes it easier for us actually to understand ourselves and the different types of karma and the different, uh, you know, different positions that we're in. So we need all of this. We need all of these different characters until we don't. So silencing the different characters will not help us. For as long as they have something to say, we need to listen. Because then they're just voicing what's in us. Right? And by listening, we don't have to externalize. It's when we're not listening that it will have to manifest outside of us. Because as I always say, the volume button has no end. Life will present an information, gradually increase the volume until we can hear it. So it often starts with silent conversation, <laughs> then becomes inner conflict. If we don't deal with it, it will become an external conflict. If that doesn't help, that will clump together with similar conflicts and it will become bigger uh, movements of conflict in the world around us. So where we're at, a lot of people are not listening. And now we have to. And that's a great thing. It's just understanding the, the kind of organic movements of karma and conversation. So yes, listening to our own conversations, this is not a problem. It's not a problem that I have different perspectives and positions in myself. That is just the reality. We are to learn to see things from different positions, but also learn to go beyond the conflict. And just like when we look at you know, a coloring box that so we have like millions of different colors. They can all be in the same box. We can have all colors and we can learn how to apply them and to express ourselves. So when we have a conflict with something in ourselves, it doesn't mean that the essence of what it is should be removed. It's simply that we don't understand it. We haven't learned how to work with that particular aspect in harmony. Right? So it's always about healing. It's always about learning and being curious and not believe the conflict. Because as we see in life, life is in harmony. There is absolute room for anything and everything at the same time, in the same space, in the same point. The conflicts are because we don't understand how that can be possible. But we learn. Right? So embracing our inner conflict, say that our conflict is simply misunderstandings between different positions, not having to figure out how to be in harmony. We can figure that out. Right? So having a loving, healing approach, an intention with whatever is going on in ourselves and not see it as a problem because then we think that this should be gone. This shouldn't be here. Where it's the opposite, that the reason why it's a conflict is because you haven't given room. Anything that is under pressure will scream. Right? When something has infinite space and acceptance, there is no conflict. There is nobody screaming. There is no power. Because of what can be gained, everything has been given. So it always comes from denial 
and suppression. And that's where our inner conflicts are coming from. So we need to learn to do the opposite and learn to be kind of the adult, the wise consciousness present to everything in ourselves. Right? Because any, any and every single misunderstanding will be resolved at some point. And because the universe is in harmony with itself, everything in us can achieve harmony too. And we can then live from that harmony in the world, no matter what the world is doing. Right? So it's really trying to, to see that it's all the same. Ultimately, when we see ourselves like through these different character and positions, if we see it as the same, if we see it as love, if we see what is being communicated ultimately comes from love and that we are turning that into conflict and we're turning it into power games, we can heal that. When we decide that there is infinite room for everything, also in us, and that we love and accept absolutely everything, unconditionally. And we try to meet our inner conflicts from that perspective, we will often be able to see what it is about and how we can heal it and how we can integrate it. Right? So the moment we stop believing in the conflict, there is no conflict. So it's really that simple, but of course I know it can be difficult to do, but it's really that simple. Mm. All right, we have a question from Germany. It's very interesting. How could we understand this question about democracy from a more heterogeneous perspective? And she gives two examples. First, the shift in generations that, for example, there are many people who have already experienced dictatorships in previous decades while others, the younger generation, have never experienced them. So how does that affect uh, the context and the discussion of democracy? And then the second she gives is the older generation, also mentioned above, experiences democracy in a practically different way from their experience because democracies really have been responsible for so much productive, constructive growth and economic miracles. I mean, they really have achieved a lot. And then um, they've experienced benefiting from smart people in government. So now then you have the flip where the younger generations experience democracy as feeble and fumbling and a bunch of idiots who are leading. So can, can that help us at all understand the situation? Yes. It's, um, when, when you have young people who have not experienced dictatorship, dictatorship seems more enticing because it's more natural for humans. And remember that it doesn't matter to them whatever we have achieved in our civilization when they feel confused and afraid and depressed and suicidal and self-medicate. All the other stuff will not matter then. And we've also, I've talked about this a lot, we have now for a few generations been obsessed with feelings, as feelings are so important. So we've basically groomed the younger generations to feel too much and believe that their feelings are more important than anything else. And then they behave as if their feelings are more important than anything else. And this is what you get. And then they are consumers. They, they demand that uh, their feelings and needs are being met immediately. If not, they don't care. They really don't care about anything else. So the feeling that a dictatorship at least is different because it's a form of protest as well. If they can't have what they want, they just want to see the world burn. They don't care because they've not been trained um, to care about anything beyond their own feelings. So when they have not had the experience, they think that, for instance, dictatorship can 
mean freedom because it's cutting through all the bullshit. Um, it's kind of funny when, when people seriously say that a dictatorship will give me freedom. And that's kind of one of the talking points that, that uh, we see both in the States and in other places in Europe. Whether it be because there's like, uh, the political system is, is, is so corrupt and all of that. Yeah, look at dictatorships. That's not all idealistic, you know, and taking care of each other. It's more corrupt than anything else because it means that the ruling classes are turning anything into their private property and just using people as disposable items, you know? There is no freedom for the individual unless you're part of the few. Um, so, but unless you've had that experience, you don't believe it. Um, because you're not pleased with a service, mm -hmm. so you'll take your business elsewhere, so there, right? You, it, it just starts with that emotion. And it's completely understandable. And I think uh, where we are now, people will need to have the experience of dictatorship to be able to kind of move past where we are. And dictatorships can, can work. Uh, it, democracy is not necessarily the best model for humans um, because it often means that the stupid people end up on top. So since we are very hierarchical, having an informed um, hierarchy, with good leaders, that is also possible. When you look at the Chinese model, they are trying that, but humans are corrupt, right? So it doesn't quite work, but the idea is that the best people should gravitate to the top based on merit, based on ta talent, based on them having sh kind of shown themselves and what they can do. But because we're also tribal, they've also turned that into the loyalty, right? if you have the right beliefs, if you have the right way of thinking. So you, you end up with uh, what they've got. But as a model, what they're doing in China is more suited. And what we will see also in the West, when we go like you know a couple hundred years into the future, you will see a refined version of the Chinese model. So if you can think that we make a mashup of some of the elements we have in democracy, but in the hierarchical structure like they have uh, in China, this is kind of where we're heading. It will be, because when, when you think of it, we live in a dictatorship already. When it comes to companies, for instance, right? There are a lot of companies that uh, control your life. No democracy there. And we also see freedom of speech being controlled by companies. That's dictatorships, right? There's so many rules, uh, so much bureaucracy, and so many things like you have very little influence in reality, right? Because you can't, it's too complicated. So we're already there, right? And in the West, we don't have as much like freedom of speech as we uh, want to believe. When we look at Russia, for instance, when we look at how many people are put in jail for their political views and what they express, like per capita, it's a lot lower than we have in the West. I think like there was something like uh, in the UK, which has a much lower uh, level of, of uh, citizens, I think they're at like at least 10 times higher than all of Russia. People are put in jail for what they post online, right? We, so we have in many ways less freedom of speech than they have in many dictatorships, right? And so we are not as free as we think we are. And we control by brands, by companies, and we just mindlessly follow, spend our money where we're told to spend our money it's, we're being manipulated all the time. So in China, they have a different system. It's not necessarily worse, and it will be re refining itself over time. 
What is interesting about the Chinese system is that their goal is prosperity and happiness for the people. We have forgotten that part in our <laughs> part of the world, <laughs> right? We, we never talk about that. Prosperity is not a thing. Right? Making people happy and like having like, you know, fulfilling lives. Because in the West we are not. People are drowning. And this is why all of this is happening. Because people, this is not working for me. And I, I feel lost. We need to dominate. I just want something else. I want someone I can feel is on my side. It's completely natural. Right? So when you look at the Chinese system, in many ways, they're closer to that. So no system is perfect because humans are involved and humans are corrupt. Mm -hmm. right? But um, we will definitely, the, the, the s political system we have in the West at this point will not survive because it is corrupt. It has failed. And it's not, it's, we, we don't have the freedoms Corporations control everything. People feel enslaved. So it's more honest to have a dictatorship because then it's what it is and then people can deal with it. At least then they know who's in charge. Right? When companies are in charge and you have no idea who's, you know, and they're influencing, then dictating what you can do and what you can't do, people prefer a dictator. Right? So this is also part of it. We just need to look at it and see this is where we are. Democracy has failed the way it is now, and we need to figure out something better. It will come, so like it will take quite a bit of time, and it will be a period that will be so chaotic, and we are in the beginning of it. Uh, I, I will just mention one more thing that is this interesting. When we think of complexity, we have lived now for, since you know, the, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, in a kind of like unipolar world where we have had like one superpower, that was the United States. We've become used to, to, to that. And they kind of dominated everything. It used to be the Soviet Union and the United States, at least you had the Cold War and all of that. But what, what's happened since, of course, is China, and now the axis with Russia and China, and they're kind of now rewriting the script and uh, rewriting the maps. And India will also become much more powerful. You have the African continent, you have South America, you have the Arab world. Representing different perspectives all want power, right? So the West through the United States will not be the only one anymore. Just think of that complexity because the United Nations have now become nothing because there are so many different perspectives and um, countries with power that the United Nations really can't do anything anymore. So everyone is free to make up their own rules and how things should be. That's just one level. And then you have what will really influence the world is you know, anything that's got to do with security, that's, that's military, that's uh, how, like, how things work in law and rules and regulations and how that will work globally and what type of models will be applied, right? Also, when you have a unipolar world, it's easier to use that as a template and then everybody should uh, work according to that. That will change. So it will become more complicated and on top, also when it's come to the economy, think of now the, the trade between China and the United States have never been higher than right now. And we're on the brink of World War III, right? So everything is so integrated. So the economy and how business works is already global. And there are so much like power games going on in the world of business and who's to dominate in what way. And then you have also the world of information and tech. And who is in control of what? Because they basically uh, 
own the narrative of what the world is, the stories that are being told, who we are. And just look at how um, Americans were completely manipulated through social media, right? We're all being manipulated, and it depends on, you know, who's using digital information and in what way. This will become even more intricate because think of when AI becomes more of a thing. You can live in a world that is completely tailored to you. Every piece of information you will be exposed to will already be filtered and selected for you. And that will form your opinion about everything. Right? And think when the government will use this. You will think that you are very smart to figure out things on your own, but all information you have available will already be filtered. So you can be shaped in a certain way. That will be an important part. And then on top of that, you have how people use technology and how people connect. So that will be yet another power base. So you have so many different kind of layers of power bases now. And the Cold War is nothing. This will be a, like a type of complexity in how these different levels will interact and how each of these levels individually will also fight their wars. This is already starting. But when you go 10 years ahead, this will be a reality. It will be so complex, nobody understands who's in charge and who's doing what. So people will be even more drawn to, we need to cut through. This is too difficult for all of us. So hierarchy, domination, uh, being on the right team, all of that, it will continue. It's not like we're moving out of it. We're on the way into it. And then, of course, AI will be used to assert power, right? So it's a very different future than we're used to, and it will be both wonderful and complex, and for many people, so confusing that they want AI to tailor the world to them so they can live in their own private bubble. People will be so easy to manipulate. To work on our own spiritual awakening in this landscape is challenging. Right? Because it will be so easy to be drawn into a world that is tailored to you. And people will feel that's pretty cool. Many people will want that. They just want to not have to deal with anything. And dictatorships will offer that. Companies will offer that. And most people will want it. Right? So how do we then wake up? Well, you better start now, bitch. It's <laughs> you better prepare because this is not getting easier, right? We, we need to do our daily meditation because it's the only way we can connect and connect past. This world will become so controlled, so tailored, so manipulative that a normal person will not stand a chance. We're just at the very beginning, right? And for many, many places, spiritual work will not necessarily be legal. Because even what we do in our minds will be controlled. We're not there yet, but we will get there. So it is important to build a strong kind of foundation in ourselves and understand how to connect and how to work and how to keep kind of growing and how to keep unfolding and how to assist other people in snapping out of this. Um, this is a collective journey that, you know, the soul synchrony, they want that. It doesn't mean that they're supposed to stay in it, right? It may be a starting point in that their next step is actually figure out how to break out of it. This is also necessary for humans in this planet to reach the next level. It takes higher consciousness. And it also takes for humans to want it and to want it more than the artificial world. Remember that, that what is also happening is when humans are now confronted with, we're fucking everything up. What we do instead is create synthetic worlds where we could just pretend everything is fine, right? So we don't have to deal with what's really happening. Humans want it. Do you want it? Or do you want to deal with reality? Because if you want to deal with reality, you have to deal with the reality within, as we talked about. 
You have to deal with your karma. You have to deal with you. You are shit. Whatever it is, you need to do the work. You have to prove it. Otherwise, you have no credibility. If you're full of noise, if you're full of karma, and the world moves in this direction, you will just be part of it. If you want to wake up, I would suggest that you work hard now while you still have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> while the world is still operating in a way that gives you the opportunity to have the space you need to do that work so you, that you may make a difference. There will be an enormous need for pathways to set oneself free from this. Humans will become addicted to everything in all directions. Just think of your own habits and your own ad addictions. If you think that's in all directions, a normal human will not be able to disconnect from it. So it takes a strong stamina and a strong kind of connection for real. And to do the work so that we cleanse out as much as possible, then we can kind of be the rescue team. Then we can assist people who sincerely are here to wake up. But then we have to do the work ourselves, and then we also again, have to allow for the world to do what is necessary for the collective consciousness. So, you know, that's what we're dealing with. The solution is always us, right? It's always lifting our own consciousness, and we do that by letting go of the sandbags, which is our own karma. It's fun to live right now. The juxtaposition between human nature and our civilization is ridiculous. And this is why all of these things are happening, because it cannot be stretched further. Right? That rubber band will snap. And which way we're going <laughs> depends on like, how evolved the collective consciousness is at the point of s s snapping. <laughs> right? So... We're there for, like, in, in both. You can see how primitive humans are. You can also see the potential. You need to make sure that you belong to the future and that you don't let your primitive patterns take over, that you don't let yourself be controlled by them. But you have to practice. It doesn't help just having a belief system. You need to practice every day. You need to do the work every day. You need to refine yourself. You need to set yourself free from this culture of um, victimhood and entitlement. You need to contribute to the world. You need to be someone. You need to stand for something. You need to carry and behave according to your, your value systems. You need to make a difference in the world. Right? You, know, you need to show the way for other people. It doesn't just happen. Part of spiritual awakening is taking that responsibility and utilizing the point of evolution you're in. The more light you channel, the more you become a lighthouse in that exact point of evolution that can assist other people in navigating. So you can think of we're all in different places, different spaces, different points of evolution. If we're all light up, others can navigate, they can see the light. But then you have to cleanse yourself. Then you, ha you have to allow the light to come through. You have to vibrate. You have to dedicate yourself to the purpose of being a lighthouse for others to navigate. It is not for you to instruct. It is not for you to tell other people how to live your lives. But by standing firmly where you are spiritually in your consciousness and where you let your light shine, it's up to others to use that in their own navigation. And that's all. It's your responsibility. It's your potential. And this is the most important thing you can do for the world. Because the reason why people are navigating towards all of what we've been talking about is because they can't see the light. They can't see the future. They can't understand how to move and how to grow. So you need to offer your light 
but then you have to choose it. So do the work every day. Be dedicated to your spiritual practices. Try to let your light be present in the world. Try to let it be visible to others. You see that? It's the absence of bias. It's the absence of judgment and opinion and politics and fear and all of that. That is what allows your life to come through. You can't be full of the noise and the light at the same time. So through spiritual practices, you can cleanse it out and allow for the light to be present. And then where you're standing, what you're representing, will be one of many lighthouses. And if there are enough lighthouses in the world, this planet will light up and people will see what's going on. They will find their way out of their own darkness. And they will find their own path. The solutions are not through politics. It's through consciousness. It's not, it's through spiritual presence. The expansion of awareness. So this is the most important thing you can do, not only for yourself, but for the world. Take your function as a spiritual light bearer seriously. You never know when you meet someone who needs to see the lighthouse so they can just navigate to where they need to go. But if you're not, if your light is not switched on, you're not in service. Always, always let love lead you. Always let the light be present and visible. The only way to lift this planet is by lifting yourself. And then set the example. Then become a tuning fork and inspire others to do the same. It doesn't happen by convincing or pointing your finger. It happens by you being in harmony, living in harmony, and that you clean yourself, detoxify yourself, and become that light. The world needs individuals who can carry that light more than ever. Do not waste your life trying to figure things out and be part of the collective noise. Set yourself free from it and become the example of what happens next. Thank you, Vikaya. A clarion call to action. May we all uh, be on the part of the rubber band of civilization when it snaps that propels us forward into growth and love and evolution. And part of that can be liking and sharing tonight's episode with friends, family, fellow spiritual seekers. And truly, they need not be spiritual in any way. Tonight's episode is really about, you know, a major... <laughs> It's a discussion about the way we live our lives and how we want to lead our world going forward. So please share widely tonight's episode with anyone who might benefit. Um, be sure to subscribe to Ikaya.Official here on YouTube and on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And we very much look forward to having you with us again this next Monday. 19 o'clock or 7 p.m. Oslo time, both online here on YouTube Live and live and in person here at Ikaya Center in Oslo, Norway. 
So until then, let's uh, get out there and be lights in the world.